All right. You're wrong. Gary, before you mute, how many do we have? Uh, there are 57 attendees currently. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. I am Neil, W2NDG. I am up in Highland, New York, up in uh, the Hudson Valley, transmitting from uh, the place I affectionately call the compound. Uh, we moved up here a few years back and uh, bought a house that's uh, very ham friendly. Um, it's been a lot of fun. So, but we're going to talk about Raspberry Pi today. And uh, I'm going to extend that a little bit because there isn't a whole lot that's happened since uh, last year. So maybe a little quicker through history and basics this year. So first of all, um, who am I? Um, I got my license in 2011 as KD2APZ and uh, went for my initials as my call sign. Um, I am a uh, senior computer systems engineer for uh, the Sloan Kettering Institute at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, it means I, I work on non-standard computer systems, all, all the crazy stuff that no one else will touch. Um, been a shortwave listener and just radio buff since I was a little kid. Um, electronics, radio, could never get enough of it, but uh, didn't get my license until 2011. Um, I do a lot of kit building, you know, something that I enjoyed when I was a kid and I brought it back when I became a ham. And I run a little web page called radiokitguide.com. That's Valley. And I always throw a random fact out. I used to be a Snapple salesman, you know, one of my uh, other lives. You can email me at neil at neilgoldstein.com. Um, a copy of this uh, PowerPoint, as well as any pertinent links, um, will be posted on my blog, which I'll give you the address at the end, um, by uh, tomorrow evening. So. All right. So quick overview and uh, what is a Raspberry Pi? We'll talk about uh, some of the basics and layouts, features, and finally what we can do with it. The Pi is simply a computer. Um, there's really the best way to explain what it is same components of a large computer, input, output, audio, video, everything you would use on a larger computer. Uh, Neil, just quickly, just quickly, Neil, your slideshow is still in the uh, preview mode. Oh. I'm going to restart. Let me just restart the presentation. Somehow split into two instances. But it was on the correct slide, right? No, it was not. Okay. I think you have them on the... Oh, there we go. Uh, that is the presenter's view that we're seeing. There we go. That's correct. All right. Sorry about that. So there's a picture of one. And we are up to this next one. A Raspberry Pi is not the same thing as a microcontroller or Arduino. Um, I've been playing around a little more with microcontrollers lately. Um, Arduinos and other microcontrollers are more specific purpose-built things for doing one or uh, several specific tasks. Um, they have the same GPIO bus functionality, which allows us to interface with the outside world. But uh, Arduinos, although there are exceptions, I know, um, Arduinos are not normally devices that you would hook a keyboard, a monitor, and a mouse to and browse the internet with or do some of the radio with. But there's definitely a place for these, and we'll talk about that towards the end. So system on a chip. Um, we started seeing this um, with some of the uh, cheaper laptops that came a number of years ago, cell phones, um, where they're starting to integrate more and more components into a single chip. So you have the processor, you have the video, you have the memory controller, you have storage control, everything in one chip. 
and that allows us to shrink these devices down to their current size and also make them more power and heat efficient. These devices are what we call RISC or Reduced Instruction Set Computing Processors. Um, the Pentium processors, which uh, we say Pentium or x86 processors that are still in your Windows computers, are complex instruction set processors. They are not as efficient. Um, when Apple was still selling computers with uh, RISC processors, and now they've actually gone back in that direction, but years ago, they always used to have to try out that you could not compare the speed of their RISC processors, which were PowerPC processors, to uh, Intel's Pentium processors. That uh, at the time, a 500 megahertz Pentium could be outperformed by a um, PowerPC processor running less than half of that speed. So they are very efficient, but obviously, since they're not x86, they're not directly compatible with our Windows. So the original Pi was released in 2012. They were going for accessibility to try to get the computers into more hands and in the hands of students. This was done a long time ago by the British Broadcasting Corporation with uh, a computer from uh, Acorn in Britain way back in the 80s, back during our Commodore 64, TI-99 4A, uh, a lot of those early systems. The Beeb, as it was called, BBC Micro, was a really popular computer that was subsidized by the British government to get kids into computing as those same goals. And as an aside, the BBC has produced a, uh, a modern take on that, something called the micro bit. And this is more of a microcontroller, uh, like an Arduino, but it has a little matrix display on it, a tiny microphone and some other uh, sensors. It's a neat little device. Uh, if you like playing with this stuff, you can look into these. I have one and it's pretty cool. So well, I'm gonna run through the history real quick here this time, but this original model A, the original model B. Um, what is an A? Because uh, they still make a model A. It's uh, a reduced feature Raspberry Pi, less ports, doesn't have the onboard ethernet, um, usually uh, a simpler single core processor. Why would you want that? Um, usually power efficiency. If you don't need all those extra connections, features, um, you can have a device that's going to draw a lot less power. But this is the original Model B. The first ones had 256 megs of RAM. They immediately found that wasn't enough and went to 512. They evolved. The B Plus went to a different form factor. They did away with that big RCA port for the uh, composite video. And these were powered over um, micro USB connection, five volts. Now you can see this form factor held for quite a while. Pi 2 model B, the Pi 3 model B, and each evolution here added speed, better processing features. We had Wi Fi at this point, Bluetooth. Pi 3B plus, and this was the last before we had a form factor change. So these had a full size HDMI port on them. As I said, micro USB for, uh, for power, and then this little three and a half millimeter jack for audio and video, composite video. Went to the four, there was a complete form factor change and uh, USB three ports, which allowed us also to have faster ethernet now, or it was USB based. They went to two video outputs, the are micro HDMI and USB-C power, still retaining the three and a half millimeter connector here. Zero came out around that time. It's about the size of a stick of gum. The original one did not have Wi-Fi powered through one of the micro SD or micro USB ports and the other one being uh, for connectivity or depth. You want to hook any full-size uh, USB connections up to it, you pull an OTG or on-the-go adapter and uh, a hub if you want more than one connection. These are all 
running on uh, also micro SD cards. The original Model 1 used the full-size SD, but they've been micro SDs since then. The Zero W added Wi-Fi. Um, great addition for this thing since it's uh, kind of hungry for ports. So there are ways to uh, configure these without a monitor um, on PowerUp. You can put a little config file in the root directory of your micro SD card uh, that'll automatically connect it to your Wi-Fi. Um, the SSID name of your Wi-Fi and your password, you can put that a little config file and this thing will power up and connect. There are other ways also to get that to work through a uh, hotspot feature that some of the uh, distros and software packages offer. Uh, but either way, once you have that connectivity, you can uh, log into this thing with uh, an SSH terminal and uh, start doing some configuring. The Pi Zero 2W, a little more speed. Still a very simple device. Um, and these were very inexpensive. Great for little tiny embedded projects like uh, the one that we're most familiar with seeing these in is uh, digital radio hotspots for uh, DMR, D Star, and so on. This is the Pi 400. It's a Raspberry Pi 4 encased in a keyboard. Uh, the biggest change here is they eliminated that little uh, three and a half millimeter jack. So no more uh, physical audio or uh, composite video. So the audio is going to come out over the HDMI only, or you can use a little USB sound card, which a lot of the projects we do in ham radio are using that anyway. I mentioned the Pi Pico because we talk a little about microcontrollers here. This is similar to an Arduino Nano as far as what you would use it for. It's a little microcontroller. They're very inexpensive. And uh, they just recently came out, I think, with a Wi-Fi enabled version. Um, there's lots of little projects you can do with these. I have one for a, uh, a little weather display. It gets uh, weather from the internet and the time and displays it on an e-paper display because I haven't played with e-paper yet. This is the compute module. Uh, these are used for hardware embedded projects. If you're designing something around the Raspberry Pi form and function, you can uh, design it to plug into something like this carrier board here. So just use this as the core of your design. Here's some layouts, the old uh, Model 3 layout and 4, which we already showed pictures of. The operating system, um, there are other operating systems you can run on the Pi and you can search for that. There's some websites that list uh, versions of Ubuntu that run on it. There's some uh, media projects for turning the Pi into what we call a set-top box, uh, something like a, an open source Roku. Um, but the official operating systems that are on the website now are just Raspberry Pi OS, which used to be called Raspbian. And uh, it's available in uh, a few flavors. There's an official 64-bit version now, which is nice because you can now address the uh, 8 gigs that the Model 4 is capable of being ordered with. Um, the regular version is 32-bit. Um, there's the legacy Pi OS, which is for the older versions of the Raspberry Pi. I think uh, 64 or, or, well, 64 will only run on the uh, the versions that are 64 compatible, but the regular Pi OS, I think, will only go back to uh, Model 3 or the late Model 2s. But either way, if you have a Model 1 or an early Model 2, you're going to need the legacy version. And Raspberry Pi Desktop is actually a version of that Linux operating system for a regular computer. So you can get that same look and functionality for testing things. Um, they have an official Raspberry Pi Imager app for several different operating systems. So you can create your little micro SD card. So are there limitations? You know, what can't run on it? Um, because it's an ARM processor, you can only run applications that have been compiled to run for that type of processor. Um, so like if you're, if you're looking to uh, do something like Wine, which is a program uh, it's a layer in, that you can install into a Linux machine to allow you to run Windows programs on a Linux desktop. It's not an emulator. It basically runs a translation 
um, level for converting calls that went to to Linux calls and vice versa. Um, some people have been trying to get it to work. It doesn't really work on ARM processors and not really worth trying. There's plenty of apps you can run on these. Um, can you get Windows to run on? Well, uh, that's kind of come back. Uh, when we first started talking about the Pi here years ago, uh, the first version of Windows that showed up for the Pi was based on uh, kind of a hacked version of Windows 8. It was called the Internet of Things Windows for the Pi. It wasn't a full operating system. It was just designed for uh, what they call IoT devices for running applications. Now, because there are Windows devices with ARM processors again, uh, people have been able to hack the ARM version of Windows into the Pi. So it's not official. It probably violates some terms of service, uh, but you can get Windows to run on a Raspberry Pi again. Um, Android's still kind of funky. There's some projects that we're trying to get it to run, but uh, it does not run well. If you want to run Android on a Pi, you probably want to look at one of the Pi alternatives, which um, there are plenty of other people that have tried to come up with um, things like the Raspberry Pi. There's a lot of them out there. Um, we're actually going to look at one briefly here. So, but uh, one that got really popular in ham radio because of the Kiwi SDR project were the uh, Beagle boards. But um, we've been having, I, I tend to tell people just to stick with the Pi because of the support. There's just so much support in the Raspberry Pi community for these devices. Uh, they've been incredibly popular and there's just so many applications and hardware. There's so many things you can interface with the Pi out there. There are things that work with some of these other ones, and there is some cross compatibility here and there, but the Pi is usually the way to go. The way to go. But um, we've had supply chain issues. I mean, we hear this with a lot of things. It really hit the Pi industry um, really hard. Um, a lot of the newer, like Raspberry Pi 4 boards, have been really hard to get. I needed one for a project recently. The only way I was able to get a brand new one in the, the specs that I needed was to order it as part of a, a kit. Um, it was a, a sensor project using a, they call a hat or a accessory board designed by Microsoft uh, for um, an interfacing project. Um, it was interesting. I was able to purchase the whole thing. I don't need the other parts of it, but I didn't pay uh, like 100 or 150 dollars for the whole thing like some people have had to to get the boards what they have been producing has been going towards the commercial needs because there are plenty of things that need these boards work um, they just released a whole load of them into the market um, a few weeks back and uh, the head of the raspberry pi foundation says by the third or fourth quarter of 2023 they expect to be back on track by chain um, what we might also see at that point is the next evolution of the Pi. Obviously, they're not going to release a Pi 5 or 4 Plus until they have the ability to produce them and sell them. So the alternatives have been a little popular because some of them are more readily available. If you look through, there's so many. Uh, I found the Banana Pi to be uh, probably about the closest thing to the regular uh, Raspberry Pi as far as being readily available and widely supported. Yes, there's plenty that are similar, I know. I'm sure people are uh, wanting to type out the name of their favorite Pi alternative, but that's one of the most popular ones that is the closest. Uh, pardon me. Sorry about that. Um, there is a new expensive alternative from a company called Innovato, the Quadra. It uh, runs uh, Debian Linux. Uh, very much looking like the Raspberry Pi OS, and they cost only $30. Here's a, a little view of that thing. Um, if this form factor looks familiar to anybody out there, it's because, yes, you're right. It's one of those cheap Android set-top boxes repurposed for regular Linux. Um, in fact, I have one of these old Android set-top boxes and compared the two, and uh, they are very, very similar. Um, it does have, uh, it has um, physical Ethernet port, which is nice, and HDMI. Um, it does have some connectivity. What it doesn't have is a GPIO bus. 
this isn't something you're going to be able to put, you know, one of the hats or accessories. You're not going to turn this into a, a, a DMR hotspot, although you probably could. There is a way to do it, I'm sure. But these aren't made for that. These are for just running applications and interfacing through uh, USB ports. Performance-wise, it's about like one of the Pi 3s. It's not quite up to snuff as a, like a 4 or 8 gig Pi 4. So what can we do with a Pi or something like a Pi? And it's a computer. You can run any application that will run on it, just like a computer would run. It's not going to be as fast as a uh, you know, modern uh, uh, Core i9 desktop, obviously, but the, the Model 4 is pretty quick. Um, you can use it as a computer on your workbench or so it's a secondary machine. Um, but the GPIO bus gives us the ability to add all sorts of devices and interface with things. Um, I have a, a short list here, but there's so many things you can do with them. And obviously what we're here to talk about is ham radio. So there's plenty of uses and this is constantly changing. But um, when I first started demoing the Pies and uh, using them with uh, SDR, um, R, like the RTL SDR dongles, you can do the ADSB airplane tracking on them. Um, originally, for the older ones, we did remote SDR servers. Um, if you needed to have a receiver in a location um, that you couldn't be in or couldn't put a radio in, you could put a small Raspberry Pi box and uh, one of these dongles and then run the uh, the decoding software on the other end of that connection somewhere else. Um, you can run full SDR software on them now after the later Pi 3s and now the Pi 4. Uh, digital radio hotspot, which I keep mentioning, uh, there's so many of these devices out there running what's called iStar. Um, you can use it as an echo link node, uh, repeater controllers, um, APRS, Whisper, um, there's a, a way which we'll talk about to actually make the Pi transmit the whisper signal. Um, antenna controls, antenna switches, rotator controls, um, TNC for packet, um, spectrum monitor. That's what you're seeing here in this picture. Uh, PSK31 or other digital modes terminal. I was talking about that in the, the last forum if you were here. Um, I've got a little one here sitting next to me that uh, it's a great portable digital terminal. Um, Rig Control, there's a commercial product out there called Rig Pi now for that. And uh, as a transmitter, which I mentioned, somebody discovered that you can modulate a couple of the GPIO pins at high enough frequency to produce an RF signal. It's a dirty RF signal. You really need to filter it, but it works. The original project that uh, kind of proof of concept for this was an FM stereo transmitter. And uh, basically was a, a stripped down Linux distro with no graphic uh, interface, just uh, full text mode. And uh, it booted looking for a config file and uh, music files. The config file basically told it what frequency to transmit on and what order to play the music in. It's basically what we call a playlist. And uh, it would transmit an FM stereo signal over your chosen frequency. Uh, you want to put a really tiny antenna on it because the uh, FCC rules with transmitting uh, the FM broadcast band are pretty tight. Um, I did try hooking mine up to a larger antenna once just to see what it would do and was rather alarmed uh, to see how far I had gotten from the house and was still receiving it and immediately turned around and went home and unplugged it. So be careful with this. Uh, I'm not sure if the distro is still out there, if you can still download it and run it, but it was definitely cool. So once someone did that, they started modifying uh, the transmit software to get it to produce other modes. Um, there is um, a project out there from uh, Tapper, the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio Group. It's what we call a hat or an add-on board that allows you to transmit directly out of the Pi. It takes that unclean output, filters it for, in this case, 20 meters. And Tiny bit of power, the filter and buffering system does amplify it a slight bit and lets you run a whisper transmitter directly. Uh, when we used to do this forum live, I would demonstrate from the one I had put together. And there was a way to modify this board by cutting a trace or putting a jumper on it. 
uh, that allowed combination of that and an SDR receiver actually give you the ability to create a little Raspberry Pi based transceiver. Options for that now. Um, the Web SDR project at webSDR.org and Open Web RX, which is the open source side of the Kiwi SDR project, um, are capable of working with uh, a Pi and uh, RTL SDR dongles. Um, so that's uh, another way to get your uh, your receiver up on their systems. This is uh, a TNC running on a Raspberry Pi, some hardware that sits on top of a Pi for doing uh, packet. Digital hotspots. This one is mine, uh, running uh, for DMR. Uh, you can set this up for DMR, D-Star, P25, um, Um, the ones that run similar uh, vocoders like Fusion and DMR allow you to do uh, cross-mode work. Um, you can't do that between uh, D-Star and DMR on these. You would need two separate ones. But these come in all sorts of uh, styles and flavors, but most of them that look like this are running something called PyStar, which is a specialized piece of software running on top of a simple Linux distribution. You just burn it to an SD card and put together one of these uh, Raspberry Pi Zero W, so it has Wi-Fi connectivity and a tiny little antenna for transmitting and receiving. They make full duplex. Presentation. Um, as I mentioned, I do have a little seven inch touchscreen one sitting next to me here that I can use as a digital mode terminal. And, um, it does work. This, what you see running on, was uh, uh, somebody who took the WSGTX code and tried to uh, reconfigure it for. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do that. I can show you how. Um, there's a number of little digital radios from uh, QRPIs, uh, CR kits, no longer um, Midnight Design Solutions, but um, Hans Summers at uh, QRP Labs has a really cool one now as well. And a combination of those and the power source, and uh, you have a really neat station for using somewhere outside of your home. Uh, another thing you can do with these pies, a project called Ham Clock. Uh, get a little LCD display, and you can do this with uh, anything all the way down to a Pi Zero. But um, this is one of the ways to make the Ham Clock project. You can do it with a microcontroller as well. But uh, doing it on the Pi is really simple. I think the um, HamPi Linux distribution even comes with this app already in it. Um, you just install the app, do some configuring and run it, and you get this display that you can have uh, in your shack or on your wall. Really nice, and uh, it, it is, um, it's active, it's functional. You can uh, click on the display and get different results from some of these different uh, little apps that are plugged into it. MSJ is selling something called the Rig Pi, which is a remote operation interface. Um, you buy this box, it's based on Raspberry Pi, hook it up to your rig and the internet, and by running uh, client software on the other end, it allows you to I was looking around for projects before last year's forum. This was one that came up. It is still available. This is the Caribou Light Raspberry Pi hat. This is a uh, software-defined radio uh, hat that sits on a, like a Pi Zero and 30 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, gigahertz uh, coverage. Now, something new. Uh, I knew this was coming last year, but it wasn't uh, really ready to talk about yet. Asher Farhan, um, created a rig years ago called the uh, BitX20. And uh, it was a mono band transceiver, sideband transceiver, used some very uh, simplistic designs. It won some awards. It's been kitted by a lot of different uh, kit manufacturers. It's a mono band analog uh, transceiver. Um, it evolved. He started a little company called HF Signals, and they were selling originally a mono band version simplified of that radio. 
that you could buy mostly assembled and just by uh, putting it in a case and adding all the connectors and controls to it have a really neat um, at first analog and then digitally tuned transceiver uh, then it evolved to the micro bit x which was a multiband eventually now up to version six where it's like putting together legos you just buy the kit from them which is just the boards the case and you just plug everything in uh, test it and you have a working 80 through 10 transceiver uh, with a digital display uh, because the hacking community and ham radio is so active and a lot of people really enjoyed taking that radio and doing a lot more with it um, it the idea kept growing of what we could do with it Asher started wondering about making an SDR version of the BIDX, basically. And because this is not really um, a portable or QRP rig in his mind, this is something you would have in your shack, and that's what the design originally was. He went for the Raspberry Pi as the processor in this design. Uh, Pis are not particularly power efficient when we're talking about uh, designing QRP rigs. So, but this is, uh, running a Pi 4 and a Pi 7 inch official touchscreen. Um, this is a very early version of the interface. It keeps evolving. But this radio, uh, I think, puts out as much as uh, 40 watts on 80 meters. I think they've scaled it back a little in some of the later revisions. Thirty, And I think that it uh, floats down to about watts out on 10 meters. But this is a fully functioning um, all band transceiver with uh, a waterfall display and other modes of display. And he has also put in um, encoder, decoder. You can see in this picture here, uh, that's what's going on on the left. There's actually some FTA. Uh, he's going to add other digital modes to it as well. And plus, it is a full functioning Raspberry Pi. You can quit out of this, which is basically a full screen application. Pi with applications interfacing. So this is the S bit X. The early release came out called the developer's edition. Um, you know, in software, we refer to, you know, beta versions of software, alpha versions of software being extremely early, extremely buggy versions. This is the alpha version of this radio. Um, I got in on it very early because I'm just really curious about it. And of course, doing this for So I bought one and put it together. Um, the receiver was really impressive. I had a lot of fun with it, but a lot of the people who bought the early ones, I have uh, serial number 69 on mine, um, uh, blew them up <laughs> transmitting because of some uh, issues that happened in transit. But we were all expecting that that was a possibility. No one's a... And sure, Farhan has since uh, shipped out um, updates to these. Um, unfortunately, the most recent update, which I need in order to make mine work again, uh, didn't arrive until yesterday. I didn't have enough time to get mine up and running again, but maybe for uh, next year's forum, I'll have this thing working. But uh, it is really cool when I did have it up and running. And even though mine did eventually flame out rather spectacularly, I'll mention, um, I did have some QSOs on it. Uh, I talked to a few guys on uh, 80 meters. Um, it works, and I expect it'll work going forward. Um, I just have to get mine back together again. Eventually, this will be a buttoned-down type of radio like the version 6 micro bit X, and you'll be able to just buy this and uh, put it together, snap, snap, snap. You can see here's a shot of the interior. And uh, it's like a, the board here has a Raspberry Pi sandwich to the back of it. This is the back side here of um, a seven inch Raspberry Pi display. And then the bottom board here is the actual radio. Some of the coils for the low pass filters and the relay. So this is uh, this is a neat radio. And uh, it's part of what I call um, a new age of um, ham radio kits and DIY stuff that's coming. We talked about microcontrollers and I mentioned that um, the Pi is not necessarily the answer for some of these radios. I want to talk a little bit about the microcontroller side of this because 
there are a bunch of radios that are basing this functionality on higher functioning microcontrollers. And um, some of these are rigs you can buy now. Um, some of them are rigs that are coming, like the SBIDX. If you're not an extreme tinkerer, I don't recommend buying the developer's edition of the SBIDX. There's a lot of work to be done on it, but eventually it'll be a commercial product. Um, on the upper right here is a rig called the, the T41. Um, there's a book on Amazon you can buy that explains the whole design of this radio. Um, this is based on a microcontroller called the Teensy 4.1, hence T41. Um, and they have programmed a full SDR transceiver into that microcontroller with this display. This looks like a pretty polished radio. This is a picture from the book. Um, this radio is something that you will be buy very soon as a kit from the four state QRP group. And uh, I expect the initial release to be a little more polished than the, uh, the SBIDX. So, and the TNC41 is a pretty advanced microcontroller. Um, the impressive ones are the people who have managed to get radios functioning on the controller that's in the uh, Arduino Uno or the uh, Atmega328. Um, Hans Summers has the QCX, which comes in version, which is the mini, and a larger version as well. And they have a lot of features and a lot of functionality into this radio. It's a monoband CW rig, yes, but it'll also do uh, whisper. Yeah, you can set it up as a beacon. And uh, a couple of engineers in Europe looked at this design, and uh, the computer programmer uh, side of this pair of engineers, who is uh, Guido, um, PE1NNZ, managed to shoehorn enough code into an Atmega328 to get an SDR radio running on it. And uh, Manuel, DL2MAN, was the hardware side of this, um, designed the modifications to the radio. The first versions of this design were uh, Hans Summer's QCX radio basically reworked through uh, a modification project to turn it into a little SDR radio. The final version of it, which is called the True SDX, with the TR in parentheses, um, the final version of it is sold by one official retailer in China. You can buy it as an assembled radio or a kit. This is a six-band software-defined radio that does CW, sideband, and through interfacing will do digital modes. It's about the size of a pack of cigarettes. It'll put out five watts with a 12 volt feed. Uh, it's incredibly efficient power wise and has a lot of features. It has uh, filtering, it has AGC, uh, it has noise reduction, um, and it's uh, still being engineered. The thing to be aware of with this radio is uh, that there are so many clones that were taken from earlier versions of the project or even the current one. Um, that you want to be careful that you're getting the official one. Uh, but the official radio is a lot of fun. Uh, you can also power it with five volts through its USB port, and uh, it'll put out about three quarters of a watt running uh, five volts. Um, does it work? I have made QSOs on mine, uh, plenty of them, transatlantic ones. I've talked to people in Europe with five watts sitting in my den here in the house using the Alex loop indoors and hooked it up to the big antenna here as well performance out of it. Definitely a neat little radio. The lower right here, which uh, I have one running here right now in the shack, is the Hans Summers QDX. This is a digital mode radio, but it uses software-defined radio, once again, running on a microcontroller. Um, and uh, it, I think this is, you know, a lot of the future of our hobby is being able to run so much more with uh, so much less hardware making them more power efficient and size efficient. Um, this is a digital modes radio. Like I said, it works for uh, FT8 and um, will not work for PSK31. It won't do uh, phase shifting based modes. And uh, what's cool is because of what it's based on, if you go into the configuration on this radio, um, you can uh, flip it to IQ mode and use it as an SDR receiver. Works. You can uh, hook up, uh, SDR software to it, like uh, HD SDR, Ubic, and um, just receive with it. 
uh, with a waterfall and tuning, you know, wherever uh, between the bands so you can uh, decode broadcast stations and utility and everything else. But uh, a lot of functionality just out of microcontrollers. Um, since the Pi Foundation, one of the last, you know, things that they're experimenting with were microcontrollers themselves, I would like to see a more powerful microcontroller or some sort of hybrid project that could come out of this, allowing for even more functionality and efficiency. Um, like I said, I can't say enough about the true SDX, um, just what it is capable of doing at its size, at its price, and at its um, very limited power consumption. So take a look at these. There's a group's IO group called Raspberry Pi for Ham Radio I recommend getting involved in. And if you just Google Raspberry Pi Ham Radio, you'll get some other people that have uh, written uh, special packages, distributions, and everything for it. But there is a book uh, showing here that you can get on Amazon, Ham Shack Raspberry Pi. This is um, the uh, Raspberry Pi specific distribution, Linux distribution called HamPi. Um, cool thing is he has now modified HamPi to also run on the Innovato Quadro. Uh, so there's a special ham distribution for the $30 Raspberry Pi like device I was showing off. What's my message? <laughs> I don't know how that got in here, but that's supposed to just be uh, my final message. That's funny. So that wasn't in my editor when I was editing this slide, but I apologize. So uh, as I said, I will post um, a link to this set of slides on uh, fofio.blogspot.com by uh, tomorrow night, probably. And you can email me at uh, neil at neilgoldstein.com. If you can't remember the Fofio address, just neilgoldstein.com will eventually get you there through a link. Um, but that's where you can find all this information. I'd like to show you some live stuff real quick, um, but we can also do some uh, questions if we like. But let me get out of this presentation. All right, and we are back. So uh, first of all, uh, through VNC, I have, um, the Pi terminal that sits next to me. I'm going to try to pick this up and move it over to the camera so you can see what it looks like. So this is an official Raspberry Pi 7-inch touchscreen here, and it's in a housing that has and a little power jumper so you can power the whole thing off of one connector. Um, I got the housing on uh, Amazon and the the screen is the official Raspberry Pi touchscreen, which I recommend if you're looking at the seven inch touchscreens, works so much better than some of the generic ones. Um, I do have a Pi here, I'll hold up to the camera. This one's in a case with a little three and a half inch touchscreen. I had trouble getting this to work correctly. This was one of the generic ones. Uh, the display works fine, uh, but I have to use it with a uh, little keyboard and mouse because I could never get the touchscreen part of it to work properly. Um, and I don't think it's anything I'm doing wrong. I think the hardware on that one is all right. Um, continuing uh, show and tell, here's an older Pi board. This is from the uh, Model 2, Model 3 type of layout. And you can see full-size HDMI port, micro SD power. These are still useful. There's plenty of things you can do with them. I know one thing, if you have an old like laser printer laying around that you really like but doesn't have connectivity, um, you can create a uh, server out of an old Raspberry Pi. Um, this is one of the uh, DMR hotspots or basically digital audio hotspot. And uh, this one is running on a Pi 4 with a duplex board, hence the two antennas. This one will do simultaneously. I also have somewhere, sorry, I'm not sure where, but I have one of the smaller ones like was in the uh, presentation, the tiny Pi hotspot, which is Raspberry Pi W-based. Um, 
the Innovato Quadro, the one that we can look at is actually running in the next room hooked up to the network, but they look kind of like this box and give you size reference um, with uh, ports on multiple sides of it. And uh, there is an SD, micro SD card slot on it. Um, this one came running uh, Android, but the uh, Innovato Quadro is basically the same form factor, same looking. <laughs> And we can look at that. I'll try to bring it up on the display here. It may have gone to sleep since I first turned it on at the beginning. Let's see if it's actually working. Try to connect to it. Like that. Now, it probably went to sleep, but basically it just looks like a Raspberry Pi desktop, which, uh, Gary, is the ham clock still up on the screen? Yes, it is, Neil. Okay, so I'm going to quit out of ham clock here, but uh, you can see some of the functionality of this. I can change a uh, little uh, locational line here. And I'm getting weather. I can choose where that weather is coming from, all sorts of things. But let's quit out of this. All right. So this is a, a Pi 4, and it's running on uh, this 7 inch terminal that I was showing you. And we are remoted into that terminal using VNC. And uh, I have WSJTX running on it. And you can see all these spots here. Uh, we did have a QSO in the last session, you can see, and we completed that QSO with somebody not too far from here, but I uh, saw a local station come up and chose him just because I wanted to make sure it would work. But um, the radio that we're looking at is the Hans Summers QDX. That is what we're connected to. You can see more spots coming up here, and I can transmit. Um, I can double click one of these as it's coming up. And if I'm out in the field, I mean, I'm getting a full display here. This is the same thing I'm seeing on the Pi terminal. Great to see, so I'll tilt it a little bit. But you can see it's identical to what you're seeing on the presentation screen. Um, and the way I'm doing this is there's a little function here that says menus, this little checkbox. And if you uncheck it, you get that much more screen real estate and WSJTX. You can also go into the configurations, obviously with the menus enabled, and you can change the font in the display. Um, it's pretty tiny on the seven inch. I definitely need to use my reading glasses when I'm looking at it, but it works. And you can mess with that a little bit. I have some room to play with the fonts. I just like to get a lot on the screen at once. And uh, also with the uh, waterfall display for WSJTX, you can adjust the zoom uh, by playing around with the controls and you can get the full pass band for this WSJTX band that we're tuned into across the waterfall. Um, out of the box, no, no, you're only gonna see a little bit of it, but you can change this so you can see the full waterfall. So there's a, there's a pie running this. Let's minimize. Just to show you, I mean, there's lots of stuff in here. Radio. I've got plenty of apps here. I don't have a, an SDR dongle plugged into it, but I could switch at this point the UDX over to IQ mode and run something like cubic SDR right here and actually get functioning um, SDR. So I'm gonna stop WSJTX here, but we can relaunch it. I'm gonna go into the browser.
great. Back with the browser. All right, so this is just Chromium. And uh, some of uh, the Chromium browser will sync with your Google account. They have removed some of that functionality. But the reason why I'm putting this up here is to show you that you can do things like the, uh, the founder's own SDR site here. Frequency, if we want. Look at the center of the 20 meter band. Let's see, zoom in. Browser. So we have enough CPU here to play with some uh, web SDR. And this will work for a locally operating SDR as well. So, Gary, do we have any questions coming in or comments or anything? Uh, let's see. No relevant questions at this time. Yeah. OK. Is there anything else anybody wants to pop into the chat that they would like to see? Um, I do have some other things I can do. Un full screen this. STR receiver here. Surprised that one is uh, not so. This is the famous uh, Milford, Pennsylvania one, which a lot of people use. Okay, we do have an attendee asking for a, a simpler explanation of how they, how you would suggest they get started with all this. Okay, um, there's a number of companies. One of them is uh, Canakit, C-A-N-A-K-I-T, out of Canada. Um, um, that sell Raspberry Pi starter kits. Um, to get the Pi up and running, you do need a number of things: um, a proper power supply. Uh, video adapter to go from that micro HDMI port to a monitor. Um, you definitely want to have, uh, you know, have a keyboard and a mouse around for it. Um, but they sell starter kits. There are starter kits out there uh, from some of the, the sellers. If you go on Amazon and just search for a Raspberry Pi starter kit, um, they even come with uh, the books or a subscription to uh, one of the online ones. Um, you definitely want to get the most modern version, the Pi 4. Um, the Pi 400, if you don't need something tiny that you have to put inside of a little case. Pi 400, like I showed in the presentation, looks like a little keyboard, and that eliminates the need for a keyboard. Um, and they're a little more readily available than the small ones. Uh, but you can buy a Pi 400 to get started. And uh, getting the operating system on, system on it is fairly simple. You go to the Raspberry Pi Foundation's website, raspberrypi.org, or, or raspberrypi.com, and they'll walk you through getting it set up step by step. You do need a micro SD card, which uh, those starter packets will give you. Some of them come with the, already with the latest version of Raspberry Pi OS on the card, but it's not hard to get it on there. And once you have that running properly, and you've tried to uh, download and install some applications, um, you can try something like HamPy which there are step-by-step step in, step step instructions to get that running on it. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, in the presentation, it's a computer. Um, you have, as you can see, you point and click interface similar to Windows, and uh, you could run a lot of applications that'll be very familiar to you. So you can do a lot with them. Some of the kits that are out there are for people who want to learn programming. The Pi is a fantastic platform to use to learn programming with. 
and you can write little applications. Some of the programming software is oriented towards children, but it's it's great. It really is. You don't have to be a kid to use it, where you're actually writing programs using little puzzle pieces that you fit together, and the code uh, appears next to those uh, little building blocks that you're putting together. And it's a great way to teach what programming actually is. So there's a lot of ways to get into it, but a starter kit is a really good way. Want to get into microcontrollers? It's the same sort of thing. This uh, holiday season, um, the one of the um, um, Pi groups from the UK, I think it was um, Pi Shop UK, uh, was selling a Raspberry Pi Pico Advent calendar, uh, where you had 12 little boxes in a larger like display box. It was very well packaged. That give you um, 12 steps of a project, which include learning how to program the Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. And uh, it went from just simple uh, programs like Blinky, which is basically just a couple of lines of code that make an LED blink on and off and on and off, and ending up with uh, sensor projects that are sensing what's going on in the outside world and a programmable um, uh, LED display and uh, a little, uh, there's lots of things you can find on uh, Amazon like that if you want to learn. And don't be afraid to learn programming. I'll say that to everybody. Um, I'm not a programmer, but I can sit down and write code using these books and these instructional guides. Uh, and you'd be amazed what you create. Okay, get a couple more questions here. Next one, are there no x86 alternatives by Intel, AMD, or VIA? There are. Um, you can look for them. Um, the thing is, is when you uh, take x86 machines and shrink them down that small, sometimes you do, uh, you're giving up functionality for the sake of heat, um, but there are some that work okay. There was a product out there for years, and I don't know if it still exists, it was called the Latte Panda, and that's just like the coffee latte, L-A-T-T-E, and then Panda, the uh, black and white animal. Uh, but the Latte Panda was a Windows computer about the size of a Raspberry Pi, and you could use that different uh, systems. And, uh, I, you know, I haven't gotten into that. I have so many um, Intel-based machines running uh, Windows and Linux, um, and some of these laptops are pretty small, uh, or the little tablets that they sell. I haven't really um, had a desire to purchase one of these. but. Yes, there's definitely a reason why you might want something if you have a, a really small space, like um, a repeat cabinet, that you wanted to have a uh, Windows server running in for control or an Echo Link node or something. There's definitely purposes for little tiny Windows boards. So there are some uh, commercially available ones out there. I just, I don't talk to them in regards to this. Uh, this is more of a Linux and experimenters uh, oriented subject. Okay, then we have a couple of questions, <laughs> a couple of people asking about, what do they need to do to turn their Pi into a transceiver? Into a transceiver? Using the GPIOs, yes. <laughs> um, to use the GPIO, you mean to interface with the outside world or? And to turn it into a transmitter receiver using the GPIOs. Oh, oh. There's a number of projects, but I would start with uh, Tapper, um, T-A-P-R. Um, look for the Tapper Raspberry Pi hat, and there's a lot of discussion linked from that project on their website that'll uh, get you to the, the software that actually does this. Um, it's uh, command line software, I'll warn you. Um, and you can uh, you know get it to produce um, just a carrier. You can get it to produce whisper tones. Um, but uh, it does work, and uh, various packages you can get to make it happen. Um, i not at the programming level where I could sit down and write code that would use those pins and modulate them, but I would look for um, those two projects, the uh, Tapper uh, Whispering Pies project, and also that uh, FM radio, because I'm not sure if um, the uh, FM radio one still ex still exists, but if you were to Google, uh, um, let's see if we can actually look for that here. Um, 
I F M Raspberry I. Let's see if it still exists. Yeah, Instructable still has it. Uh, this is, I think, where I first saw the article. No, this one's a little different. <laughs> this is uh, using one of the TEA uh, modules with the Pi, which is going to interface with the uh, GPIO. No, that's not the same thing. I did build one of those, too, which is also fun. And you have code you can modify and play with. Um, Raspberry Pi FM transmitter. So just a simple Google search um, brought this one up. Oh, internet ads. Here. Let's see. Getting started with Raspberry Pi. I assume there's a link to the Linux distro here. But this is one particular article. There we go. GitHub. And it's still there. So, yes, this is one of them. I believe there's more than one project that does this. But And then the point is, is that most of these projects are open source. So if you do have the ability to analyze code modifications, you can play with this. Um, Please, if you're going to play with this and try to transmit out of the Pi, yes, it's only a handful of milliwatts, but just be aware, it's not a very clean signal. It's going to have all sorts of um, harmonics and uh, other junk coming out of it that's not potentially legal. Okay, on that, Neil, we're uh, uh, done with our allotted amount of time here, and thank you for your presentation. And thank you. And uh, thank everybody for attending and feel free to drop me an email and we'll uh, see everybody here next year. Thanks.